Hey, Recalibrated Reliance is our theme, and we've been going, of course, through a series. I'm Ed Stetzer, teaching pastor here at High Point. Glad to be here with you today. Um, we're going to look today at the question of what do I want to be known for? What do I want to be known for? Our passage is Matthew chapter 5. We're, we're kind of jumping around different places around this theme of reliance. But let's look at the passage, then we'll talk about it some. It says this in Matthew 5, beginning at verse 13. It says, you are the salt of the earth. But if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who's in heaven. So here Jesus is talking about us being known for him, the gospel, right, being salt and light. What do you want to be known for? And so what does that look like for us? And I want to, you know, because we, we, we sort of know certain people for certain things. And I want you to be participative with me for just a moment, okay? Uh, what is, the, let's take a look at this first picture. What is this person known for? Just shout it out. Acting. Sure, sure. That's, uh, that's Anthony Hopkins, right? So he's known for acting. Um, and I'd say he's got, a, he's got a star in the Hollywood Walk of Fame. But what you probably didn't know he developed a love for composing symphonies and has composed symphonies for decades, some of them performed by famous orchestras around the world. That's a composer, not an actor. Huh. All right, how about this picture? Who's that? Anyone know? Sure. Not, not Amelia Earhart. You can't see, but it could be, could be Amelia Earhart. Charles Lindbergh. Can't see from the distance. The key is the spirit of St. Louis. That gives it away. So Ch Charles Lindbergh, you probably in high school studied Charles Lindbergh. He... He was a controversial figure, a fig figure. Uh, might remember the Lindbergh, Lindbergh baby. Um, he flew in this famous plane across the ocean. Um, so he's known for those things, however, and other things. However, he actually began studying medicine after this. He actually worked with a Nobel Prize winning surgeon to develop a heart-lung machine that's ultimate, that that model is still used, a, a variant of, is still used today. So he becomes medicine. He can be known for medicine, not just flying across the world. Or how about this? This is Lewis Carroll here in the next picture. That's uh, Lewis Carroll writes Alice, Alice Adventures in Wonderland, right? Um, and, but, but here's the thing. You know, you know what? He's a professor of mathematics at Oxford University. Yeah, we know him as the author of books. See, you can get known for something that you don't want to be known for, or you can be known for something you do want to be known for. And... I think what you're known for, it may, it may not be the most important thing to you at this moment, but as Christians, Jesus calls us to be salt and light, and the reality is the salt is often diluted and the light is often blocked, and a lot of us are known for other things than that. So that's what we're going to look at today, because I think there's never been a more important time to be salt and light, and uh, I want us to be known for being salt and light in a world that needs Jesus. To do that, I want to talk about Jesus' words in several different points, and number one is this, salty Saints are essential. Can you say that three times fast? Probably not. Uh, salty, I know salty means something different to people, right? But salty sa saints in the context Jesus giving is salty saints are essential. Stay salty, my friends. So let's look at it. It says this, you are 
the salt of the earth. Now, it doesn't say you might be, it doesn't say you should be, it didn't say you could be. It says you are the salt of the earth. So currently, presently, at this moment, you are the salt of the earth. So, okay, well, if Jesus just says that, what's the point? He goes on to say this. But if salt has lost its taste, now here's the thing. Salt is a chemical compound. In high school, you learned it was NaCl, sodium chloride. Salt actually cannot chemically lose its taste because it is NaCl, it is sodium chloride, right? So what's Jesus saying? He's speaking about dilution, not diminishing. So in other words, you don't, ta you don't taste it on food. If food tastes horrible, salt doesn't fix it. Right? So like Mexican food, which I just think is terrible. I know, I know. You're like, some of you are like, I'm really offended here. You know, Donna loves Mexican food, so this is the story of my marriage. Right? So I've tried to go. I said, let me try this, right? I like all kinds of different foods, right? I like all kinds of, I like, I like Brazilian food, right? I think, I think that's great. I love Cuban food. I just, I, Mexican food doesn't really work for me. I put salt on it, doesn't fix it. So, so, and Donna loves Mexican food, so what does that mean? We go to Mexican restaurants all the time. <laughs> because I want to be, there you go, there you go, exactly. Some of you love Mexican food, right? So for me, it, it, it's salt, I can put salt on all day, it doesn't fix it for me. So Jesus says, if salt lost its taste, how, by, dimin by, by diluting, not by diminishing, how shall its saltiness be restored? Well, what's the answer? By, by ending the dilution, right? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. Right, so, um, so, so again, we, we can't fix it uh, with, uh, without fixing the dilution that's there. Now, salt was very valuable in Jesus' day. We think of it for flavor. Nobody then would have thought it for flavor. I mean, it had a flavor, but it was too expensive for that. Because salt is where we get the word salary. So people were actually paid in salt as their salary. That's how valuable it was. There's an expression that's centuries old, that he's not worth his salt. That's how valuable salt was. Salt's super valuable. Um, Jesus does not give a lot of details about what he means in regard to salt. But, but again, we think like flavor where he probably meant preservation and thirst creation. Those are probably the purposes that 2,000 years ago they would have thought about with salt. Preservation, okay, so I'm, I'm, uh, I'm Irish and I, I like Irish food, okay? So, um, so I uh, remember, you know, you've heard of corned beef, right? So, and, and maybe, uh, did you like that? I see some of you smile, do you appreciate corned beef, right? But it's not, some of you love Mexican food, some of you love corned beef, a lot of food in this week's message. Uh, but corned beef has no corn in it. The reason it has no corn is that the corn is actually kernels, corns of salt. So the Irish would take this salt and put it in to preserve the meat longer term. So if it's corned beef, it will last a very long time. So you go to an Irish restaurant and you have corned beef, it's not fresh by definition. It has been corned for a long time and that's what makes it awesome. So preservation and thirst creation. Jesus said to the woman at the well. So he's talking to this woman at the well, and, and he says, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. Jesus was concerned about thirst. Everyone who drinks of this water, he's talking to this woman at the well, will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. Thirsty is a theme with Jesus. The water I give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. And then John 14, 15 says, the woman said to him, sir, give me this water so I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. Salty saints are essential for preservation and thirst creation. So let's talk about the thirst creation for a little bit. My friend, Pastor Tim Keller says, we should live our lives and share the gospel in such a way that if someone didn't believe the gospel, they would still wish it were true. In other words, look at what it's done to me, to my life, to my, you know, some people are looking, well, I, I, want, I want what that person has. I want what she has. I want what he has. And so we want them to, uh, to see us and make them want to know the Jesus that we love. Because clearly something's changed in our life. And it's interesting because I, I was talking to somebody, trying to share the gospel with somebody not that long ago. And, uh, and, and, and they said, you know, I can really see, I love this phrase, they said, I can really see how believing this has changed your life. 
Now, don't miss this. I couldn't persuade them. Uh, they didn't respond and receive the gospel. But they said, I really can see how believing this has changed your life. Now, to them, they think it's a fairy tale. And they think that me believing this fairy tale has shaped my life. But for me, I was super encouraged that they saw that whatever it is I believed has shaped my life. Make them want to know the Jesus you love. Uh, in John 1, 41 and 42, it's not on the screen. It says, Andrew first found his own brother Simon and said to him, we have found the Messiah. He then brought him to Jesus. That, that's what we want to do, right? We want to see, go to a brother, go to a friend, go to a sister, go to, go to a coworker. We want to live our lives in such a way that people ask, what's up with that person? And then in the normal flow of life, we are telling them. That means loving our neighbors, listening to their stories, caring for the poor and the outcasts, the marginalized, right? Meeting practical needs without an expectation of anything to come, but in the midst of that, sharing Jesus. So that's thirst creation. But salt is both preservation and salt creation. So preservation, we're here making a difference, making the world more like Jesus would want it to be. Uh, we're preservation agents in a world that's kind of gone rotten. And can I tell you, it's kind of going rotten right now. And so we can be those who are preservation agents, maybe just in a small way, maybe just in a faithful presence in our own lives. Matthew 5, 9, Jesus again says, blessed are the peacemakers for they shall be called sons of God. We're called to be peacemakers, preservation, right? Uh, so when there's strife in your condo board in your neighborhood association, you want to be known as the person people come to on, for advice on how to bring an end to the conflict. When there's contention at work, you'll be known as the one who offers sound advice and brings consensus. When there's catty gossip in some meeting or context, you want to be known as the level-headed leader that doesn't stand for gossip but will encourage clarity and unity. You're a preserving, a preservation agent. So salt, you know, again, we just don't think of it as as, uh, as, as valuable as they would. So when Jesus says, you're the salt of the earth, they would see the value that it had. I mean, we just see it as, you know, Morton's, you know, Morton's. I mean, they, we get so much salt, they, they got all the salt and they built an arboretum where the salt used to be. I mean, that's, that's where that's from. That's the Morton Arboretum is a salt mine. So they just had so much salt. And so for us, you know, Donna, Donna and I have this, uh, ongoing uh, marital opportunity for growth over salt shakers. <laughs> Not, this is Mexican food and then salt shakers. So, so Donna thinks that, um, and, and she's not here today because she's actually home recovering from COVID. She's doing fine, but she's been home recovering for COVID, um, from COVID. So I'm going to talk about her because she's not here. So no one can tell her. Uh, but so we have this thing about salt shakers. So Donna likes fancy, elaborate salt shakers that sit on tables like, I guess, civilized humans use. And, and I like, you know, those cardboard circular things that you buy for a dollar at Walmart and... And so, and eventually, you know, we would keep losing the salt shaker. So we were down in Key West and I bought her a little salt shaker from Margaritaville so she wouldn't have to look for her lost shaker of salt. Um, <laughs> so, so really I did, it's a good little thing right there. There you go, there you go, you get the reference there. So, um, you know, marital bliss and harmony. So, so, but, but so for me, you know, I've got my own, so I, I actually have, but this is, this is eventually, when you've been married 30, almost 35 years, you get plans. So we've got the fancy salt shakers just like she wanted. And I have my own salt shaker in a special location that I take out when I want it. So salt's important to us, but, um, but for us, it's a reminder too, in this passage here, so powerful that, um, that salt is not intended, like, you don't like. When I was a kid, you know, I pour a little salt on my tongue, see what salt tastes like. You don't do that more than once. You learn the lesson. <laughs> salt is intended to permeate. It gets in. And that's what we are as Christians, right? It's not that we're supposed to, I mean, there's actually a book by a well-known author um, and her title of her book is, uh, you know, out of the salt shaker and into the world. So this is the salt shaker, right? Thank God for the salt shaker, right? But we got to get, we got to permeate in the world and find your place, be salt and permeate, influence and impact. Be known for being salt and light in a world that needs Jesus. Number two in our outline, salty saints live on mission. Salty saints live on mission. So Jesus here gives us a negative contrast to make a positive point. It's a common uh, approach that rabbis would have done. He gives a negative contrast to make a positive point. Here's what he says. But if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? Now we just talked about earlier, salt doesn't, as a chemical compound, it doesn't lose its taste. So what's Jesus saying? Not 
diminished, but diluted. So it's diluted. So salt has lost its taste. How shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. So you, I think you know that when I'm preaching here, I, I go back and forth between the Wheaton campus and here. I preach, um, I preach uh, twice here and twice at Wheaton on a Sunday morning. So it's always exciting to go back and forth. And uh, the, those of you who've driven to Wheaton, the train largely determines the length of your sermon. Um, so you never know if the train gets you. And then you're like, oh, well, in conclusion, I got to go. Uh, um, but uh, but I'm taking, I have a guest with me today. And, uh, and, my, and my guest is actually from South Africa. That's how they say it there, South Africa. And he is, uh, his name is Desmond Henry. He's with the Luis Palau Association and the Global Evangelist Network. And so we've been friends for, for years, and I've taught for him in South Africa and things. That's where are you, Desmond? You're somewhere around here. Desmond, oh, there he is, right there. That's Desmond right there. Say hi to Desmond. Would you mind just say hi to Desmond? There he is. Um, so he lives in, in Joburg, outside of Joburg. And so we were talking just this morning about the last few years. And one of the things he said is that, Ed, I just, American Christianity just seems remarkably different to me than three years ago when I was here in so many different ways, most of them not positive. Now, it's interesting because I think what's happened is, in the midst of some of the challenges of our cultural convulsion and the challenges of our time, is that it can be very easy that we could, we could have lost our taste, right? We've lo- we could have lost our taste, right? Now, why? Because it's been diluted and we've been caught up in other things, right? I mean, social media is such a great example of that, right? Now, Jesus was not talking about social media, and Paul was not talking about social media platforms, but look at this. This one here, 2 Timothy 2.14 says this. It says, uh, charge them before God not to quarrel about words, which which does no good, but only ruins the hearers. 2 Twitter (laughs) 2.14. Right? I mean, come on. I mean, like, wow. So, Not quarrel about words, which does no good, but only ruins the hearers. So what happens is a lot of people's gospel witness has been diluted by our lack of thoughtful, winsome, Christ-like engagement in social media. We've become known by our neighbors. Now, again, social media is not like a thing of just a certain demographic. I mean, no, my my mother-in-law, the kid's grandparents, are constantly making comments. Matter of fact, they'll, my daughters will say to me, tell grandma to stop commenting on my social media. Because, and what am I gonna say? You know, I'm not gonna say to grandma, stop, oh, I love you, honey. She just comments, it is what it is. So, but a lot of it, now I'm, I'm active on social media, Donna's not, she just scrolls through social media and looks at it and uh, sometimes shakes her head. Um, but this kind of reflects that, right? Look at the, just a couple verses later, 2 Timothy 2, 16 and 17 says, but avoid irreverent babble for it will lead people into more and more ungodliness and their talk will spread like gangrene, Second Facebook 2, 16 and 17. I don't want you to miss this, right? Um, there is a reality that your saltiness can and perhaps has been diluted by your public engagement that distracts people from the gospel and makes them think other things about you other than, I wanna be, I'm thirsty because of what I see in this person's life. Are you tracking with me? Are we still friends? Because I think we have to be honest about that, right? I gotta work through this. We all gotta work on these issues. We become deluded through vain and empty talk, not just social media, but the gossip maybe we engage in the work, the, the political games that don't honor the Lord. When we focus on whatever it is, momentary issues that don't have eternal weight, our effectiveness to be agents of preservation and agents of thirst creation diminishes because it's diluted. Now, I'm asking you to be intentionally salt this week and this month and this life. Um, to be intentionally thought salt to make sure that nothing has diluted and thus diminished your Christian witness. You say, Ed, but I want to comment on every single thing. I get it. I get it. But does it dilute and thus diminish your Christian witness? And if the answer is yes, you might ask, how might I use the Lord's wisdom and be known for being salt and light in a world that needs Jesus? Which gets us to number three on our outline. Let your light shine. Let your light shine. Remember, be known for being salt and light in a world that needs Jesus. Uh, You are the light of the world, right? This is a phrase, right? You are the light of the world, Jesus says. Pretty strong, right? You, now wait a second. I thought Jesus was the light. Actually, he says that. John 8, 12, Jesus says it this way. Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. Wait a second. 
Is it Jesus or is it us? And the answer is yes. I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. So you become the light of the world because Jesus is the light of the world. But the theme here is to shine. So this week, uh, you know, I've talked for, I have three daughters. It's kind of a rule here at High Point to have three daughters. Um, uh, not everyone follows that rule, but you know, Ron and I have. Um, so I have three daughters and one of them lives in Canada now. She's home right now. She, we, we brought her home last week um, from Canada. I, I drove her home. I was speaking in Canada Tuesday, drove her home. And that's when Donna, you know, tested positive for COVID. So welcome home, kids. Um, Mom's locked in the room upstairs uh, five days ago, so we're all good. But, um, but when my daughter moved to Canada to do her master's degree at the University of Toronto, she moved into downtown Toronto, kind of like Manhattan in New York City. And she didn't need a car, um, won a car. So I inherited uh, back my car, my 2008 Honda Pilot. So I, I drive a 2008 Honda Pilot. And uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't have like, it doesn't have any media jacks. So it kind of, so I now, when I, when I talk on the phone, if you ever talk to me in the car, I, I, I take my phone, I, I'm like my mom. My mom walks around, she, she puts it on speakerphone. Hi Ed, how are you? She walks, you know, it's an old people thing. So I'm now, um, so I put it in my pocket and I do, some of you are like, yes, that's what I do. Yes, old people do that. We're, we're old people now. I put it in my pocket and speakerphone. That's my way of doing the car phone now. Because, you know, hands free, just like the law. Um, so I took the Honda Pilot in this week because the headlight burned out. And, but it was like super weird because the headlight on the right burned out and some other things, I've got some steering fluid issues. Anyway, you don't hear all my problems. Uh, but the left headlight is remarkably dimmed. And so I said, what's the deal with the left headlight? And he said, well, you know, because I, I thought, is it like, is there some sort of, because clearly the right headlight was bright until the light bulb went out. The left headlight is just terrible and uh, like all dimmed. And he said, uh, so I asked him, is there like some gas in there? Like, is there argon, like argon's between your window panes? Is there some gas in there that's leaked out and ruined it? He says, no, your headlight's just dirty. <laughs> and I said, well, I've tried to wash it because it seemed a little insulting, right? So I said, I've tried to wash it. He said, no, no, it's like, it's, like, it's like in the lens dirty. It happens over time. He says, you know, your car is over. I said, I know how cold my car is. It's all good. Um, so, so they said to me, um, we can fix that. It's $60 and we will polish. But what's, what's basically happened is your light can't get out because you're, the lens of your headlight, not the lamp, but the headlight, like the case, the, len the lens of it, has just stained because of time, because of weather, because of the elements. And it can't be washed, but it can be polished. You can polish that. $60 will polish that. And I said, oh, I got a 17-year-old. They'll do that for $10. And so, <laughs> so, but the point is, the light's there. It just can't get out because the lens is stained over time. It's just, it's just, it's just normal, happens to these kind of age cars because of the plastic lens that's there. Okay, so the light is not getting out. And I think that's kind of the picture Jesus is giving here. I am the light to you are the light. But the theme here is to shine. John 12, 46 says, I have come into the world as light, so whoever believes in me may not remain in darkness, but the light is not shining as it should. So a couple of ways light does that. First, light is to give sight. Light to give sight. Again, we want to be known as salt and light in a world that needs Jesus. So I just came back from um, two weeks in Europe and, and Israel. And so I'm going to have to share for the next few times I'm preaching, I'll be giving examples from Israel. It's kind of a rule. Now, it's not so bad. I'm not, I don't have a slideshow of my family trip, my family vacation. And I don't have any pictures. But when we were in Israel, the, the, I would teach some and this other professor would teach some. I'm a, I'm a professor at Wheaton College uh, uh, in addition to being teaching pastor here. Um, so I would teach some. The other, and, and there was a tour guide. And the tour guide, we're standing at night, and he would say, um, we were actually at the place where Jesus gave this Sermon on the Mount, right? And we actually stopped there, and, we, and the, the other professor and I both shared. But the tour guide would say, Jesus probably looked up and pointed at a city on a hill not far from here. Because in Israel, not all of them, but they often build cities on top of hills. They're not quite mountains, not like the Rockies uh, or, or even the Adirondacks. I mean, they're, 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 more, um, they're more like big hills, small mountains. But like Jerusalem is built on a hill. It's a city on a hill. So you could see Jesus. He was on this plain 
uh, by the side of a mount, and he would say, he might have pointed up to the city that was thousands, thousands of years old today and says, a city set upon a hill cannot be hidden. And if you go out at night and you drive the highways, you can literally see on the top of these hills, these cities that are built on top of these hills. You're not supposed to hide that. It's there for a purpose. You are a city set upon a hill. So it's not just you're a lighted city, but you're set upon a hill so people are supposed to see. So a city set upon a hill cannot be hidden. It goes on to say, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket. Now, some of you right now are going back, if you grew up in church, to a song, right? This little light of mine, I'm gonna, and then the second verse is hide it under a bushel. Some of you grew up in church. All right, so others are like, why did everyone just say no all of a sudden? It's kind of like a second grade song. I'm going to let it shine. Hide it under a bushel. No. Um, now, so this is where that comes from, right? Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket or a bushel, but on a stand, and it gives light to all the house. So villages in Israel are built on hills, and you can't miss them. Israel was supposed to be a light to the nations. Jerusalem is mentioned as a city set on, on a hill. But Jesus says, that's now you. You are, you say, I don't feel like a city. The point is, you're a city set upon a hill. People are supposed to see the light shining from you, from the church, from God's people. And I am among those who think that the last few years, that light has been diluted, that salt has been diluted, and that light has been diminished because of our witness has not been clear. So Jesus gives examples of how we might use it rightly, a city and a lamp, which... Leads to the second thing, light to point the way. Light to point the way. Remember, be known for being salt and light in a world that needs Jesus. Okay, so it says next, in the same way, okay, the city on the hill, so you're in the same way as a city on a hill, let your light shine before others. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. So they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who's in heaven. How would they give glory to your Father in heaven? Because they're now believers worshiping and glorifying the Lord. So there's a connect, this is a clearly an evangelistic connection, right? They're gonna see your light, see your works, and result is they're gonna become followers of Christ, give glory to your Father who's in heaven. Some of you knew the song. Were any of you, by show of hands, were any of you when you were little, if you're in church, I didn't grow up in church, so I didn't have this, but any of you, were, when you were little, were you a sunbeam? Was anybody a sunbeam? I see some sunbeams. I see some sunbeams. Okay, so um, that's kind of an old school thing. Um, little kids would be sunbeam. That was the name of the program, right? So different programs that kids had, you know, um, and one of them was sunbeams. And I love that language because the light shining. C.S. Lewis in his letters to Malcolm says, back up the sunbeam to the sun. Maybe that's what we need, is a greater sense that Jesus is our focus. So it actually switches in the middle of the text. I don't know if you saw that, but it says, uh, it says, you are the light of the world, let your light shine. So one is who you are, one is what you do. The light you are switches to the light that you show. You live out who you are, and this is clearly connected to being a witness. And I've already expressed that part of my concern is, is that for many of us, we've been caught up in too many other things and it has uh, diluted the salt of our witness and has diminished the light of our witness. Now, um, there's a book uh, by, by a very well-known Christian book. It's called uh, Out of the Salt, Salt Shaker and Into the World. So this is the salt shaker. The salt shaker's not bad, right? We're together. We love the Lord. We're worshiping. Uh, we're actually, I mean, that's part of who we are as followers of Jesus is to be in a church family. But the point of this passage is to be the salt in the world, to be the light in the world, uh, to be the light in the midst of the darkness. So shining your light only around other believers is missing the point about this passage, not the totally teaching of scripture, but you know, who turns a flashlight on to, in a lit room? You don't even see it. So shine your light in dark places. So here's what's dark in this kind of context. It doesn't mean that it's always as bad as it could possibly be, but without the light of the gospel are members of your family, are People who work with you or neighbors, friends and family members, they are without the light of the gospel. Actually, it's a very fascinating and powerful verse that describes 
their lack of seeing the light. Paul writes it in 2 Corinthians. Here's what it says. In their case, the God, smaller case, so this is the God of this world, the evil one, the God of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers, right? So their unbelievers are in darkness because their minds are blinded by the evil one, keeping them from seeing what? The light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, right? So how might they see the light? Because you're the light of the world, right? So you are the light, you show the light. They're blinded from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For what we proclaim, the salt we are, the light we shine, is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, with ourselves as your servant for Jesus' sake. For God, who has said, let light shine out of darkness, has shown, shown is not a verbal tense we use a lot, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So we are reflecting the light of God, the light of the gospel. So let your light shine. Now, as we come closer to the end of the message, you might be wondering, is the after message song, this little light of mine? It's actually not but it does talk about we are the light of the world. So let me give um, one more passage than a parable. John 8, 12 says this, Jesus is speaking, says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but have the light of light. So you are, you shine as light. So let me tell you a, a parable. So it's written by a guy named Max Lucado. Maybe you've written or read a Max Lucado book. If you have kids my age, you know Max Lucado as Hermy and Wormy. Uh, little children's characters. Some of you are smiling. If you're my age, you have kids my age, you remember that as a kid. So Max is a friend. Max is actually going to be here. We have our uh, annual conference called the Amplify Outreach Conference. I'll invite all of you to. It's over at Wheaton. Uh, and it's in October. Uh, I'll actually be living in the UK this fall, but I'm flying back for that and to, and to preach a Sunday here. Um, and so, uh, but we're coming. It's such an important conference for us. Max will be there speaking. And he's going to talk about some of these things. So I invite all of you to come. We've had people from High Point come each year. So let me read the parable. This is all Max Lucado. I'm just reading it. There was a blackout one night. When the lights went out, I fumbled to the closet where we keep the candles for nights like this. I lit four of them. I was turning to leave with a large candle in my hand when I heard a voice. Now hold it right there. Who said that? I did. The voice was near my hand. Who are you? What are you? I'm a candle. I lifted up the candle to take a closer look. There was a tiny face in the wax. Don't take me out of here. What? I said, don't take me out of this room. What do you mean? I have to take you out. You're a candle. Your job is to give light. It's dark out there, but you can't take me out. I'm not ready. The candle explained with pleading eyes. I need more preparation. I couldn't believe my ears. More preparation? Yeah, I've decided I need to research this job of light giving so I won't go out and make a bunch of mistakes. You'd be surprised at how distorted the glow of an untrained candle can be. All right, then I said, you're not the only candle on the shelf. I'll blow you out and take the others. But right then I heard other voices. We aren't going either. I turned to the other candles. You're your candles, your job is to light dark places. Well, that may be what you think, said the first one. You may think we have to go, but I'm busy. I'm meditating on the importance of light. It's really enlightening. <laughs> and you, other two, I asked, are you going to stay too? A short, fat, purple candle with plump cheeks spoke up. I'm waiting to get my life together. I'm not stable enough. The last candle had a female voice, very pleasant to the ear. I'd like to help, she explained. But lighting the darkness is not my gift. I'm a singer. I sing to other candles to encourage them to burn more brightly. She began a rendition of this little light of mine. The other three joined in, filling the closet with singing. I took a step back and considered the absurdity of it all. Four perfectly healthy candles singing to each other about light, but refusing to come out of the dark closet. Here's a question for you, Max writes. When was the last time you shared the gospel to someone? The world is full of darkness with many people stumbling around trying to find their way. You can be a light for them. And believe me, believe me, there's a light waiting for you. It can all happen with someone as sharing the faith to just a smile across the room, to a quick hello, 
to a forgotten friend. One of my favorite Bible passages is John 20, 21. It says, as the Father has sent me, even so send I you. Sisters and brothers, I wanna encourage you, in a time when we're called to be salt and light, always, there's been some dilution and some diminishing. Maybe it's just a hard to relate to people in the last couple of years, hard to meet new friends. May we be people who show and share the love of Jesus, who are salt and light in a world that needs Christians to live out who they are. Would you pray with me? Lord, we come before you acknowledging that um, for me, me, for just Ed Stetzer, this has been a harder time to share the gospel, to be salt and light in the world. And I pray that you might help me where the salt has been diluted and the light has been diminished to address those areas. And I pray that for everyone here. We are the light of the world. We're the salt of the earth. But Lord, would you remind us, recalibrate for us our Christian witness in these challenging times. We yield ourselves to you. I hope you'll do that. Say, Lord, use me as salt and light and be glorified in my heart and in my life. Father, we yield ourselves as salt and light to you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen.